Hey, Lee Merriweather here. You know, the lawyer decided to become a Sawyer and now a kiln operator. Well, I wanted to take a few minutes today just to talk about the very first kiln I ever built uh, well, and completed, I should say. <laughs> the first one was a solar kiln I started, but did not finish because I switched gears to do this one. Uh, so this is the, this, the guts behind this is a Nile L200M, also known as the Woodmiser KD250. Uh, I actually bought this one from Woodmiser, but the it's actually designed by Nile. And this was done in a hurry. I had a lot of wood I needed to kiln dry fast, and I needed to sterilize it because it was going to a commercial space. So I picked this area that's actually inside of my garage. So this is part of my I gave up my bay where I used to park my truck to build this. It was supposed to be temporary, like a year. <laughs> now we're going on year. We're starting in year four. <laughs> so one of my goals for 2024 is to build another uh, container and move the guts of this into the new container. But for now, um, this is a key part of our kiln process. And I'll show you the outside of it. Basically, we created a shell inside of the garage to build this. It's um, It's got three fans. So uh, ideally, I would have, I probably, if I were to build this again, I would do four fans. You can technically do a two. It's just you can't dry as fast. Three does a fine job. Um, so I may actually... No, because I'm actually, the new kiln I'm thinking about building is going to be a little bit longer. So I will add a fourth fan to that. So here it's a little wider than most kilns uh, that use this unit. And when I say wider, for this, we're talking about for something that rolls a cart in. Uh, most of the time it's a little bit thinner. I did this because originally I was going to have a six foot wide cart. And... That turned out to be a mistake. It was too wide. I couldn't, uh, the, the cart I actually built kind of fall, fell apart up more. It warped on me after the fourth. I made it out of big, thick timbers, but having them go in and out of the kiln, heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down, by the fourth go around, it just didn't work. So I uh, now I have that kiln cart, which is only four feet wide and obviously that's a little bit too narrow for this wide space. It still works great. Um, it's just some wasted space. I did add some three by threes, if you see on there, um, added those, because sometimes I will put in a stack that is five feet wide, which increases the total board footage that I have inside the kiln. These are my baffles. They're very inexpensive. It's just sheets of, sheets of insulation that I had left over. And as you can see, they've gotten beat up. This one is gonna, I'm gonna replace this one today, this little baffle here. Um, it started to break after three years, but it's done a fine job. The reason you baffle, you have baffles is because these are gonna go down on the stack of wood and then you have the fans blowing. The air bounces off the wall, comes through the stack of wood and then comes up through to the other side. And this is what's called a dehumidification kiln. This unit right here will pull up to 250 pounds of water a day out of the wood inside of this chamber. So it does an excellent job. You should, when it gets going, especially with pine, the water is just pouring out. Now this unit uses what's called a wet bulb, I'm sorry, a dry bulb and a wet bulb system. Uh, and this measures the temperature. This measures the temperature with, with the wet, with the, wet bulb on it. I'm sorry, <laughs> a wet wick here. And so basically the difference between those two is uh, it's the relative humidity inside the kiln and what we use. Um, and then sometimes the wet bulb helps determine the diff using these two sensors helps determine whether the wood is dry. It also helps to determine when the uh, compressor inside of this when the compressor turns on to start pulling the water out. So this unit also has a heater built in. So not only will it pull out the water, but also 
uh, when the wood reaches moisture content of between 8 and 12 percent, we will increase the temperature on it in this chamber. We'll turn off the compressor, increase the temperature to between 150 and 160, and sterilize the wood. Now these sensors hanging, these are actually sensors, all these cables, uh, they go, you drill into the wood, um, some, and, and these banana, I think they're called banana clips, or, well, I can't remember what they're called, but they plug into the sensors that you drill into the wood. And I'll show you them on the other side, but uh, that tells you the moisture content of the wood. Now, I've gotten to the point where I can tell just from using the machine. I used to, uh, I still track things on the machine as I use it, but I've gotten to the point where I have a pretty good idea of how long it's going to take based on the moisture content of the wood going into the kiln. And then I monitor the difference between that wet bulb and dry bulb over there to determine when this, the wood in here is dry. So by collecting enough data, data points over the last three years, I um, actually last year I quit using those probes for the most part. There's exceptions to that, but for the most part I quit using those probes because I have a pretty good idea of what it's going to take to the amount of time it's going to take to dry the wood in here that I put in here. So, and all this, all you see a bunch of junk or pieces of wood, scrap wood sitting all over the floor. I actually use these, this wood. Um, I use this wood to help hold things in place because in addition to using these baffles, sometimes there's like a big gap here and you don't want the air of just going through this gap. So let's say you have a stack of wood that's over here on the cart, but you didn't have enough to fill the entire kiln. We need to block it here so the air doesn't go through there because the the air coming from those fans is going to take the path of least resistance. And you want it to go through the stack of the stacked and stickered pile of wood would be right here. And if you don't block this area off, it will blow through straight here. So we use tarps uh, like this. Um, to do that. Now you may be wondering, what's this tarp doing here? This is actually one of the vents that we use to control the temperature inside of here. But in the winter, this can be a major form, a major source of heat loss right here. So um, we will block this so that the, cause the fans are blowing here and they'll literally blow the heat out even though it closed, even though it closes, uh, we added this and it makes a big difference on how much energy the kiln uses and this will easily well it takes about a day or so to get up to 160 but for such a big chamber that's how long it takes um like i said this isn't the prettiest kiln i built it in a hurry i um there's probably the unit themselves that unit itself cost about the setup cost about ten thousand dollars and i probably have between five and six thousand dollars in building this kiln between the insulation and having an electrician come out and help me finish things off. Here is the other vent. This is actually a powered vent. Um, and the reason you have this in here is because if I were driving for, drying, for instance, oak or some certain kinds of woods, I don't want them to get too hot uh, because that can, there, there is what's called a, in the chart, a uh, every wood species and there's groups of wood species has a schedule to follow for dehumidification kilns and, and different kinds of kilns. But I try to, well, I don't try. I monitor the, or the computer monitors the heat in here. And sometimes I monitor it myself as well uh, because sometimes you can have errors and that the kiln could get too hot at too early and it can damage the wood if you don't follow it. So this actually connects to the, control box will go, I'll see, you'll see that in a second. And if it senses that it's getting too hot in here, this will, that fan in there will turn on and it will pull the hot air out. So now thankfully I don't have to really worry about that in the winter months as much. Uh, but in the summer months, that thing's going all the time. I mean, is kicking on and uh, that cover on that vent down there is not, is off. Now, you're going to laugh, but the door for this kiln was actually this just big panel of um, several sheets of, of insulation 
all taped together and it just slides on the ground. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but it slides on the ground. It slides over this opening and I use clamps to close it. I use these toggle clamps here and it pushes it shut. And like I said, it works great. I can get the temp kiln up to 160 degrees and depending on how cold it is outside, we're out 24 hours. So it does a great job of insulating it, even though it se may seem like redneck redneck engineering at its best, it works. The reason I didn't put doors that wouldn't open normally is because like I said, when I originally designed this, I planned on having a six foot wide cart in here, which wound up not working out. But when I was thinking about it, like you'll notice like the garage door, the garage door is here, but the inside of the kiln is here. So I couldn't, if I attached a door to this, it would hit, it would hit right here. So that's when I came up with this, this sliding door that they just slide in place. And I know it may seem like redneck engineering at its best, but hey, it works. It's been working for three years and uh, couldn't be happier. Now, uh, now on this side, this is where you can see, this is the garage. You're gonna have to excuse the mess because I, I kid you not, uh, we moved my mother recently, uh, very recently, last couple of weeks, and we didn't have time to put away all her furniture. She's storing some of it at our house. All this is going into the basement. Um, and we just haven't had a chance to put it all there. So we just, it was raining that day. So we just put it in the garage and we just haven't had a chance to move it. So you're going to have to excuse the mess. Normally this, this area is spotless. My wife parks her car here and I don't want anything uh, potentially harming her uh, car. So I keep everything nice and neat in here. All right, well, as you can see, basically what I did was I created a frame, almost like using doing a timber frame. Um, I milled all the wood myself. I created a frame uh, that would fit the these four by eight sheets of um, two inch thick Owens Corning pink stuff is what I call it. It's the 150. This has an R value of 10. I had two of them. And then I had two layers of, I forgot the manufacturer of that, that panel right there. Those have R values of 3.2, but when you put them together, it, uh, according to the manufacturer, I asked them, oh, this is the name of the company, Silka um, Pro Select. But anyways, when you, when you stack them together, it actually, it's not just 6.4, it's more like eight, um, is what they told me. And so I have two layers of that on the inside. So I've got an R value of around 28 on this kiln. It should be 30, but um, since I'm already in an existing garage, I'm not, um, it doesn't have to work as hard because it's in, already in the garage and the garage is insulated by itself. So uh, it works just fine. Uh, so this is that other, like I said, in the winter, I, um, I'll plug, Especially, this kiln actually gets used to sterilize barn wood a lot. This is what I call my soft wood and high turnover kiln. And so I put this panel to block that fan vent because it's not going to kick on when I'm sterilizing. And that helps save uh, electricity and helps get the kiln hot fast. Now, this is the um, this is the control unit. These are the fans. I'm not going to turn them on because it'll blow down those baffles, but... These switches turn on the fans. Here's my breaker for this whole control. And uh, this is the main control box. So you'll see it's it's branded Woodmiser KD250 because they sell it, but the manufacturer is actually Nile. And if you turn it on, you'll see <laughs> it actually shows up. It says Nile. <laughs> um, but I love both companies and uh, I like working with Woodmiser and Nile. So, um, Going back to building this, because I had to do it in a hurry, I was able to mill all the wood myself to create the frame uh, for the for the kiln. And you can see I left myself room to walk around the kiln in case I need to get in there and adjust something. But it saved time because I didn't have to pour a concrete pad. Um, it was already an enclosed space, so I didn't have to worry about as much insulation. I didn't have to create an outer shell for it to protect it, protect it from the elements because it was already in here. And there was an existing power source in this garage. You'll see I actually ran this 
that runs to the over there to the uh, power source coming into this building. So, because technically there's enough in here, this building, uh, the, there's space up there for to put like a an apartment, which we want to do in the next two years, which is why I've got to get this thing out of here and build another one. You could see the downside of doing something in here. Um, see that that actually when I first built this, it wasn't as airtight as I'd like. And that's actually a little bit of mold. It'll come off easily. I'm not worried about it. Um, but that is something I do have to fix. You know, I'll have to scrub it down and then repaint it. Um, so that is one, that's, that's one of the downsides of putting something like this inside of your, or building something like this yourself inside of your garage. So yeah, that is, um, that is pretty much the, uh, the sh short, <laughs> the short, uh, explanation of how this works, um, and how I built it and why I built it. By the way, those so going so those sensors that I showed you earlier inside the kiln, that's what those are right there uh, that, that monitor the moisture content of the wood that go into the machine. So the machine and it will actually give you readouts. If I turn this on, it's going to start blowing. Um, and you'll notice, like, so the compressor right now is turned off because I was using this to sterilize wood, and so you don't run the compressor; you just run the heater when you do this. So, uh, but you can see where it says, where it says probe one, probe two. So those are the probes that gives you, and that gives you an average moisture content. But I don't use it much anymore because this thing typically is running just pine and sterilization, and I, I from experience, know how long the pine takes based upon um, the moisture content that's going into the kiln. And here, by the way, if you see these, there was this extra, I just didn't feel like cutting it, but because I knew I was gonna, this was all temporary, so you'll see a lot of extra wires because I knew this was gonna be temporary, but uh, those are the sensors for the wet bulb and the dry bulb. So, and, oh, by the way, this is just sitting up here. This is the, uh, this hose is, I don't know if you noticed, it was, it's connected in there on the other side to the compressor. And so this hose actually runs out the garage. It's up here right now because I brought it in. Um, it was down below 30 earlier. And since there was no running water in it, I didn't want it to freeze out there. But uh, when we're sterilizing, I just pull that that uh, drainage hose up so nobody drives over it or anything. But that drainage hose, right, drainage hose right there runs out the garage there and drains the water that uh, comes out of the wood. So, yep, I may have forgotten something, but I think I covered most of it. Anyhow, Redneck Engineering at its best, but does an excellent job kiln drying our wood.